Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, and this is the next chapter of Mirror's Edge. We're going to be jumping into pro probably the most generic chapter of the game. It's kind of the platonic form of Mirror's Edge. There's running, there's rooftops, there's occasionally fighting cops. There's not a huge amount to say about it that's special, but I think that it is valuable in giving context to the rest of the game. So before we jump in, I wanted to highlight this comment on episode two, because it actually really encapsulates why a certain cutscene works really well. This comment is from Girl Like Substance and reads, I totally forgot how much I admire the blocking in that cutscene with Kate. The way the two women move around the space is really impressive, constantly circling, keeping the length of the desk between them in a way that sells both their uneasy relationship with each other and the physical actuality of the room. It's actually kind of startling when Faith leans in to close the gap. And then the fact that doesn't work makes the ending hug work even better. First person hugs are really hard in video games because they often expose the unreality of the whole thing, but this one works really well for all the reasons that you mention. We're so firmly rooted in Faith's head and animations that it feels like it flows naturally from that. And let's jump right in. Lieutenant Miller? I'm Faith. Kate's sister? She never mentioned a sister. Yeah, well, we're not the mentioning kind. She told me to find you if things went bad. She's been arrested. And you wouldn't be the suspect seen fleeing from the crime scene, would you? Well now, it's difficult to recall with a gun in my face. I know what you are. You know it was a setup, right? I know Kate wouldn't be capable of something like this. My captain's asking some difficult questions, and I can't even get in to see her. What do you know about something called Icarus? Why? It's mentioned on this. It was in Pope's hand. I think it's from his diary. You took evidence. Kate's the only family I have, Lieutenant. And Blue's in jail don't last long. She goes down for this. It's a death sentence. I won't stop you. I owe that much to Kate. But there are plenty of people who'll try. And I can't stop them either. You better learn how to run. Running is what I do best. Rope Burns got an office at Z Burfield International Shipping near the Riding Park subway. Should be a sign on top of the building. It'll help guide you. Look, I saw Rope Burn wrestle once. Broke some poor bastard's arm, then headbutted the ref. So if this rope burn really is mixed up with Pope's murder and Kate's setup, then he sure won't be a talker. He'll be a fighter. So, those flash animated cutscenes, they're, to be honest, not well animated for the most part, but I do think they're well directed. I wonder if the same director uh, directed both the flash animations and the in game cutscenes. Um, because I think that he does, or I assume he does um, body language and physical interactions between people very well. The way that Miller approaches forwards using his um, physicality to intimidate. It's a good touch. So I was saying that this level is kind of the archetypical Mirror's Edge experience. And what I mean by that is that it primarily consists of running across rooftops, uh, doing, you know, rooftop platforming. It has one set piece component. And um, you don't really go inside very much, you just run around on rooftops and occasionally avoid the police. It also has one mandatory combat segment, which is not necessarily completely mandatory, but still. So what you're supposed to do here is run up that wall, spring off it, swing off of that and jump onto that. That's the fast way through this section. However, that pipe is actually slightly misaligned and it is very difficult to hit it correctly. If you run at that wall with almost any momentum at all, instead of um, springing off the wall grabbing the pipe, you actually go too high and land on top of the pipe, which instead of actually letting you through just makes you bump and fall to the ground. So a lot of the areas in this game have faster and slower routes through them. By the way, I do hate these drops out of um, ceiling vents because if you do the roll you always end up going like whoop zoop straight up into a wall, which honestly just looks uncomfortable. Um, also, the forward rolls do move you forwards, but only very slightly. The actual ground traversed is way less than the animation would imply. So I'm just going to hang around in this tiny room for a second because I want to point out this. 
This is the runner icon. Um, it's the logo of the group, and if you see it, it means there is a collectible nearby. This one was hidden behind this box, very sneakily. Um, they also have these nice little drawings sometimes, which obviously are... Well, I mean, this one's powerfully thematically relevant. What do we have? We have the Tower of Fucking Babel. There's a literary illusion for you. Um, which will actually be somewhat relevant later. And because this is a game that is free with its literary references, what with Icarus and all this stuff. Anyway, well, classical references. So I'm actually not going to show off where these bag locations are because the runner uh, stashes that these indicate are locked to your account, which means that if you collect them, you can't collect them on a subsequent playthrough, which means that I would have to wipe everything uh, in order to show you where they are. And also, if I did that and then recorded an episode and then needed to re-record it for technical reasons or anything, any other reason, um, I would have to completely wipe my campaign data and start from the beginning, so that's obviously not viable. Finally, I just want to point out that they use light and dark to indicate where you need to go as much as they use physical props. This is a very bright room. The only dark area is over here, which in, and the um, bright light beyond it indicates that perhaps you can get through this gap. This is, I think, the first little shimmy gap in the... Uh, in the game, uh, I think. So it's just another example of these tiny environmental details that indicate where you need to go. Which, uh, yeah, this is a very blunt one again. Not that there's anywhere else for you to go, but they they are very, very confident in their use of light and dark to uh, direct the player. I do hate crawling around in vents, though. This is a game about speed and flow. Crawling around in vents is neither speedy nor flowing. I just do what I'm told, you know that? Yeah, well, I don't know what to do. I uh, facilitated things. And I got more folks watching me than just you. And they wanted us to wrap her up all night, those boobs. Yeah, yeah, so it don't look good for you to look at that. Take that up with them. In a few days, it'll all be over. Today's front page will be tomorrow's kitty litter. Come on! That runner won't last long. None of them will, right? The precious Project Icarus will be fine. Bye bye bye! Now don't get your panties in a bunch. Look, meet me at that new place on Reno Street tomorrow. 4 p.m., okay? Don't freak! They ain't finished building it yet. All quiet once you get above street level. See you there. And don't bring any of your friends. We good? Child, brain like this don't hold up itself, you know. <laughs> I think she, she that she breaks in a little bit early here, because he's barely through that doorway, which is currently still open before she smashes through this vent. Um, maybe he's deaf, considering his career involved being. Oh, so, Roeburn did know something, huh? Wonder who he's meeting with. Get back here, and we'll find a way to make you an uninvited guest. Hey, look sharp. I'm getting Blue's head for you. You must have triggered a silent alarm somewhere. Ass out now. Uh, well, I can't remember what I was saying, but we can learn a lot from someone about by observing their office. All we learn about Ropeburn is that he's the kind of meathead who keeps his uh, computer password on a post on his desk. This is one of the only times in the game we're going to use a gun as well. Uh, we're going to skip using it in every combat because I think it's more elegant to not. But it is very useful for opening a shortcut here. So you can blow this out and run across, but if you shoot the one above, and then do a war run and jump up to here. You actually cut out like a good 20, 30 seconds of extra running in this level. Um, and the objective is, of course, to move as fast as possible. Also, I like that flourish. These guys opening these doors is actually um, tied to your progress through the through the area. There's a trigger that you run through. If you uh, just wait beyond the doors or in front of the doors, rather. They will hammer on them forever and never actually smash them open. So yeah, that little cutscene uh, was quite enlightening. If you've been following the plot, we now know that whatever Project Icarus is... Um, well, we already knew that Kate was supposed to take the fall for it. Also, note the pipes here leading you to the left. These details are constant to the point where... Uh, when you don't have a nice little convenient subtle thing in the environment showing which way to turn, it can be kind of confusing, which we'll see in a second. Anyway. Um, so yeah, Project Icarus is something that is possibly detrimental to the runner subculture. 
Yeah, screw you, guy. Um, so yeah, hopping up through here, there's no indicator whether you turn left or right, but fortunately there's no time pressure, so it doesn't matter. Also, again, the rats are a recurring element throughout this game, which uh, really could be considered a metaphorical kind of illusion. In the thing itself, considering that uh, rats live between the cracks, they are the life form that you can't eradicate. That uh, no matter how hard you try, will remain free. So here is Future Tessa. Uh, hi. Yep, I'm in this Let's Play too. So in a moment there'll be a combat sequence that I have to focus on, and uh, I just wanted to edit, it, edit a bit of audio here as well. Because I actually find these helicopter chases uh, bring me out of the headspace of the game a little bit. It feels way less realistic that this individual could survive being machine gunned by a helicopter than all of the many, many other physical traumas that she goes through over the course of this game. Um, Watch it move up ahead. Looks like you're gonna have to fight. I think it's maybe a misstep to rely on it so heavily for the rooftop sequences. So this is the first fully mandatory fight in the game. At almost every other point you can dodge the fights. Um, but the real trick here is to make sure that you separate and uh, take them down individually because generally speaking whenever you're doing some kind of attack on one guy if there is another guy in your line of sight or that you are in his line of sight he will just machine gun you and that's the end. And now you know why I don't like to use the disarm moves because they are really hard to time. So ostensibly, if you're really good at this game and very fast, you can actually uh, immediately turn right, springboard up off of this, which I failed to do just here, which is why I wasn't trying to do it during the actual combat encounter, and onto here, and onto here, and onto here, which then lets you drop onto here, which lets you jump over here, and that tiny little thing is actually the fastest way up here. Um, this seems like a, a required combat because you're supposed to climb up this drain pipe. If you climb up the drain pipe before you wipe the guys out, they just machine gun you and you die. So, yeah, um, there's a lot of little things like that, which, uh, if you're good at the game, you can just bypass, but if you aren't, you do kind of have to. There are a few, like, fully mandatory combats also. Sometimes it's subtle environmental, uh, details. Sometimes it's very realistic, but unsubtle environmental details, which direct the player through the environment. Oh, that's right, I was talking about the runner subculture. So... It seemed kind of ludicrous in 2008 that um, just the idea that somehow uh, a subculture based on something as innocent as parkour might be demonized, but um, if we've seen, learnt anything from the last you know, decade, it's that any threat to um, an entrenched fascist power structure will be responded to with, frankly, excessive uh, propagandism. So it's not actually that surprising that a dissident faction, who are the only way that um, both criminals and freedom fighters are able to pass messages, certainly would be demonised in that way, um, and suffer those kind of witch-hunty terms. Also, as I was saying previously about the life in the city, even the trees are not alive. The only living things are the pigeons, the rats, and the humans. The um, literal reason why the trees are white instead of um, whichever... <laughs> what colour are trees? Green. Um, anyway, the reason why they're white is to avoid clashing with the colour palettes. There's a lot of very bold colour palettes in this game and that's one of the reasons why it's so remarkable, especially considering the landscape of the games industry in 2008, which had a lot of very brown shooters. Anyway, um... Green is very rarely used because it clashes with a lot of the other colours that they want to use. Um, and where green is used, it's dominant in the environment, such as in the uh, architectural office. But also, it would just be kind of confusing to have these brighter colours in the environment when, generally speaking, every area has a clear, consistent colour palette. This scaffold section, which is the set piece I mentioned, Incidentally, never run away in a straight line from a man with a gun, because that's... It works for you in this game for reasons that are not ex that are not clear to me, but whatever. Ah, I got this one. 
So I actually intentionally do that here because um, I try to avoid killing and it's very, very easy to kick that guy off here. Regardless, this is the weapon of the enemy and we shall not use it. Bye. So yeah, he basically exists to be kicked off that edge, um, which is a shitty job for him, but someone's got to do it. Now, these guys look like police, but they're actually not. Um, you may have noticed on the previous one, as I uh, KO'd him, that it actually says PK on the side of his helmet. This is Pirandello Kruger, which is the private military corporation that um, the bad guys want to contract policing out to. So you can fight both of them here, but honestly, it's way faster just to run. They, whether you get hit or not, <laughs> is kind of RNG in this game. As long as you keep moving, you'll probably survive. Um, and here, there is actually a replicable bug, which I have chosen not to show off because essentially, if you do this, hey, can you get a message to Miller? I need to see him again. Sure. If you flip backwards in the air, which you can do by using the turn 180 uh, or turn 90 degree uh, button, it will actually prevent that audio line from triggering. Which isn't necessarily relevant, but, you know, I don't want to not have the audio line in there. Which is a shame, because it looks rad as hell if you do it right. So there you have it, the kind of archetypical Mirror's Edge experience, running across rooftops, occasionally pausing to punch policemen. Regardless, that's going to be all from me for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to like and subscribe and check out the links in the description. Thank you so much for watching.